thanks for the very nice introduction. This is just a, a sideline of uh, what I'm doing. Uh, it's more related to the normative political theory side of my research. Uh, and it's actually based on a paper that was already published last year. But I don't want to give you the summary of the paper, which you, I suppose, had an occasion to read. I will uh, talk a little bit about the content of the paper and present it in a slightly different way. Uh, and uh, the, uh, the general puzzle is that uh, there is uh, a long debate now in political theory, also among moral philosophers, about wh what is called the ethics of immigration. And what they, what they mean by this is basically, can you ever justify immigration control? You know, is there a legitimacy to why states all states in the world claim the power to control immigration. That's something that ordinary folks take for granted. This is the world we live in. But philosophers like to ask these big questions. Is that compatible with what they think is required by justice? Um, and they frame this generally as an issue of justice. And I started to get a little bit worried about this because I thought there's another side to this. If you talk to citizens, they think primarily it's an issue of democracy. You know, there, there's a right of citizens to control and shape immigration into their country. So the setup is that philosophers very often, starting from a perspective of global justice, where all people are treated as morally equal, uh, arrive at the conclusion that there is no justification why states can control immigration in the first place, and then talking to citizens and also to people who are more into democratic theory, uh, you very often find the opposite position, uh, saying, well, you know, uh, of course democracy is a right of self-determination over immigration control. And the two sides don't really get together. And I want to bring them a little bit closer together. It's still as you already understand now, I think, a fairly theoretical exercise. So I won't be talking about specific countries and uh, immigration policies. Uh, it, it's a general exercise. But uh, it's, uh, I think, a little bit more down to earth and to the real world than uh, uh, you would very often find in the discourse of moral philosophers. So I start with this ethics of immigration debate. then. I raised the central question of the paper, which is, is there a democratic right of self-determination to control immigration? And surprisingly, my answer will be no. <laughs> so that takes me closer to the, uh, the, the globalist philosopher's perspective. But I, I do think uh, there are justifications for certain forms of immigration control. Uh, and I will come up with these. And, but in the end, I end up with a puzzle which I think hasn't been taken up yet which is also from a democratic perspective, you have uh, increasing polarization among citizens on these issues of immigration control. So uh, that's another reason for not framing it as an issue of self-determination. Um, so, let us look at this screen, otherwise I'll just turn my neck uh, away from the audience. Uh, the, uh, the ethics of immigration debate started really in a big way in the 1980s with uh, a chapter in a book uh, by Michael Walzer, uh, American political philosopher, called Spheres of Justice, uh, 83. And that's chapter number two, and it's just called Membership. And there he uh, explores the general way how democracies uh, handle immigration. And he comes up with this idea that democracies have to be committed to treat all immigrants as potential and future citizens. So it's deeply unjust if democracies prevent immigrants from becoming citizens because they subject them to their laws and uh, you know, democracies have to include everybody who is subjected to the laws also to, uh, in the making of the laws. They have to be represented and uh, the usual way how this works is by giving them access to citizenship. Uh, but, says Michael Walzer, the other side of that requirement of democratic inclusion of immigrants is that uh, states need the power to control immigration into their country because they know the immigrants that they select at the border will be their future citizens and members. And therefore, uh, they couldn't self-determine who they are as a political community. 
uh, they couldn't build up, as Walzer says, uh, uh, communities of character uh, uh, over, over a long time if they couldn't control and select who comes in as immigrants and, becomes, uh, and become their future citizens. Now, the counterposition to this was uh, first articulated by Joseph Cairns, uh, another American and now Canadian uh, political philosopher, a couple of years later in the famous essay uh, from Alien to Citizen. Uh, anyway, it was the, the subtitle of the essay was the message uh, uh, that was the case for open borders. Uh, and where he said, if you look at any liberal philosophy, utilitarianism, the liberal egalitarian philosophies of John Rawls and even some of the communitarian philosophies of his time, you always arrive at the conclusion that there is no justification for controlling immigration. And that's something that Joe has pursued through the rest of his professional career and the major book in which he sums up that whole argument came out in 2013 and it's called The Ethics of Immigration. So that's a must read if you want to study the field. Uh, and I'll go into uh, the argument now uh, because uh, it's nicely spelled out uh, in, in, in Joe's book. There are basically two reasons why states ought to be open for immigration. And one is uh, the ideal of freedom of movement. So the argument is that just like freedom of speech and freedom of association and freedom of conscience, freedom of movement is an essential uh, liberty that all liberal uh, philosophies have to defend. If you go back to Thomas Hobbes in the Viator, Hobbes agrees on this and he says that's what liberty means. Liberty means there are no obstacles to your movement in space. Yeah? Uh, your body is not defeated by anybody where uh, you want to move it. Uh, and where there's this absence, it means there is no freedom. So freedom of movement is a pretty important value in, uh, in the liberal tradition. Now, you can understand that value in two different ways, uh, an instrumental way or an intrinsic way. An instrumental way would be you need the freedom to move because that allows you to pursue your interests, to do what you think is worthwhile doing. It allows you to look for a job, uh, to study at the university, which is the university of your dreams, so to go to Warsaw, to be here, right? uh, to, uh, to find a partner, uh, to experience a different culture, to become, you know, you have, people have life projects and liberalism wants to uh, make them free to pursue their life projects and these life projects require that they are able to move to other places. Right? So this is the uh, instrumental reason for freedom of movement. But the other reason is an intrinsic one which says this is what freedom is about. You know, if you are imprisoned, you are unfree. Uh, and no matter whether you want to move for specific reasons, it's, an, it's an, the essence of freedom that uh, you are free to move. Um, and, uh, you know, taking one or the other side, you know, emphasizing the instrumental or intrinsic value has consequences. For example, if one philosopher, you know, we'll mention again, uh, David Miller says, well, you know, freedom of movement is instrumentally valuable because uh, people want to uh, seek opportunities, but if a state you know, that is large enough provides them with all of those opportunities and resources that you can reasonably demand from a state, not everything, you know, not, not every state needs, must have uh, a, 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 a world-class opera school. If you want to become an opera singer, maybe the state cannot provide you with that. But you know, on average, uh, if states uh, provide you with your, the opportunities you are entitled to, then you have no reason to move. Uh, and then maybe your freedom to movement of movement across the border of that state into another state is not an essential liberty at all. But if you think that uh, freedom of movement is an intrinsic value, then you would probably say, well, it shouldn't be the business of the state to judge for what reason I want to move. If a state denies me entry, it's for the state to justify why it does that. It's not for me to justify why I need so that would be uh, a quite different take that results from uh, the intrinsic value perspective. So a, a second aspect of this debate that already comes up in Walzer is uh, symmetry or asymmetry between exit and entry, or immigration and uh, immigration. 
all liberal philosophers agree that the, the core element of freedom of movement is the right to leave. Huh? If you cannot leave a state, then by definition, that state can't be a liberal democracy. Uh, it, it's a kind of prison. Uh, it's North Korea or whatever. But it's, uh, uh, that's something that qualifies a state as a liberal one that you are free to leave. But, so if that is very important, the question is then, what about your right to entry? And some philosophers say, well, if, I have, if I'm free to leave a country, but there is no other country that lets me in. Then I'm also not free to leave the country. So my freedom of exit is void unless there's another country that has an obligation to take me in. To which some philosophers like uh, David Miller replied quite plausibly, well, but who is the other state that needs to take you in? Uh, there are 200 states, about 200 states in the world. If there is one among these 200 states that lets you in, but you want to go to another one. Uh, does, is that sufficient for your freedom of movement? But in any case, the duty of states to admit people that corresponds to their right to leave is not a well allocated duty. So it's not clear which other states has the corresponding duty that enables your freedom to leave uh, so that it has to let you in unless you, uh, it, it turns you out. So this is the, the puzzle of asymmetry. If you start from the freedom of exit, it's not clear who the other state is that has to honor that freedom of exit by admitting you. And then there is another argument that is uh, made uh, very prominently by Joseph Kerens, but also by a German uh, Swiss political philosopher in a recent book, Andreas Kassiek. Uh, and uh, Joe calls this the cantilever argument. And that is slightly different. It goes like this. All, sta all modern states, uh, all modern liberal states, recognize internal freedom of movement inside their territory. This is even enshrined as a human right in the human rights conventions. Uh, now, says Joe, the reason why they do this is because uh, people have interests, as we said before, to move to other places to realize what they think is their good life, what they want to be and become in life. Now, why would it be different if I want to move from Vienna to Innsbruck uh, to find a partner or take up a job, or if I want to move from Vienna to, let's take a third country now, uh, London, right? Uh, uh, <laughs> I'm no longer free to move now. Uh, and so the reasons for freedom of movement that states have internally apply also across their borders because it's the same interests that humans pursue when they move inside the border or across the border. Uh, so that's uh, what we call the cantilever argument. You use internal freedom of movement where everybody says yes, and then you derive from this uh, uh, an expansion of the argument towards international freedom of movement. Um, I'm just uh, putting this on the table. I have a critique of this that I won't uh, spell out now, maybe at a later point in this talk. So this is the argument about freedom of movement. Right? There is a second strand in the argument for open borders, which is not about free movement, but about global distributive justice. And it was again first spelled out beautifully by, by Joseph Kerens, who says the world is a hugely unequal place. Uh, People are born into countries that have enormously different resources and opportunities. Uh, and uh, they are born as citizens or nationals of these countries. And citizenship works uh, as not just as something that includes you in the country and gives you certain rights there, but also excludes you from other countries that can control your passports and say, no, we don't let you in because you come from a poor country and we don't want these people in our territory. So it's a, it's, it's a mechanism that stabilizes global inequality. So if you uh, believe that uh, liberal states also have duties of global justice towards the worse of uh, uh, people in, uh, in poorer countries, uh, then uh, the question is, um, can they justify that they use their citizenship and immigration control systems to exclude these? And one argument is, no, they, they can't. You know, it's, uh, you actually need to open the borders for these people because uh, they uh, 
the system that uh, of immigration control is just a way of stabilizing global inequality that cannot be justified. Uh, uh, Joe says uses this this image. It's about it's a bit like a feudal system. You're born into an estate, and you cannot move up uh, in in the feudal system. And here you're born into the citizenship of a country, and you cannot move up into the citizenship of another country that has the power to exclude you. Only once they have admitted you, says Walzer, uh, are they obliged to uh, uh, turn you into a citizen, but not before, uh, not at the point of immigration. Again, there is a counter-argument uh, proposed by, by David Miller, which says, well, maybe there are duties of global justice, but the duties are limited. They're not of the same kind as the duties of social justice inside the state. And what we owe to other people in poorer countries is what he calls uh, a level of, you know, a sufficientarian level of, uh, of, of decent uh, living standards. So uh, a floor be below which one nobody should fall in terms of healthcare, education, income, etc. Of course, we know that states don't provide this, but ideally they should. But if they were willing to help the poorer countries uh, to uh, not fall be below this floor, then they don't have a reason to open uh, their borders for them. Uh, and they could well perfectly close them and, 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 and keep them out because uh, this is not what uh, justice requires uh, from them to let them in. So I've, in, in a much older essay, I've once uh, tried to uh, sum up this argument in, in the two upper bubbles in, the, in this diagram. So you have two arguments for open borders. One is the global justice argument. Where, open, where immigration, openness for immigration is seen as a remedial right in a non-ideal world, yeah. where there's huge global injustice. And you have the freedom uh, argument, which is much more an argument for an ideal world. So if this world was a less unequal place, then states wouldn't have any reason to exclude immigrants. Uh, they could let them uh, use their freedom of movement just like the states do, uh, the member states of the European Union do, because their disparities are somehow limited. And there's a joint system of governance uh, with, which makes this possible. So you have this strange opposition that one part of the argument applies to a very non ideal world and says, for moral reasons, since you cannot justify keeping the poor immigrants out, you ought to open their borders, your borders. And the other main argument is, well, in the future world, where there are no longer any injustices, you ought to open the borders, because you don't have any reasons to close them anymore. Right? So it's, uh, there is a contradiction and tension built into using both arguments, uh, as you can easily see. Now, the point is that uh, then there is a third argument, which, is, which I call the democracy argument here, that is used by those who want to step outside this discourse and say, uh, let's talk about the real world, where there are the, uh, states that uh, have sovereignty over their territory and immigration control is part of their sovereignty. And uh, they can justify this on the basis of democracy. Not global justice, not freedom of movement, but on the basis of democracy because it's part of the self-determination rights of democratically organized states to control who enters their territory. Uh, and therefore, you know, you don't need to consider the, the justice debate doesn't win the argument. The democracy uh, value is on the other side and weighs heavily in favor of considering immigration control as legitimate because otherwise, if the citizens couldn't control who comes in, they are no longer ruling themselves, you know. I hope you understand that this is uh, the... Uh, the setup of, of, uh, of the arguments. I've, in another essay, I've even suggested that maybe these three values can be, um, two of these three values can be combined in a coherent way, but not all three. So it's a trilemma. Uh, you know, like Franco Milano, which is a famous globalization dilemma. Maybe it's possible to combine justice and democracy by saying that. Uh, we have duties towards the poor countries, uh, and uh, we have to make sure that uh, our country is organized democratically, uh, and that entails immigration control. But we can meet our duties towards the poor countries without opening our borders, just by moving resources um, to the poor countries. So that's one way that cuts out freedom of movement as a relevant part. 
You can also combine um, justice and uh, you can, you can combine uh, uh, justice and remedial as a remedial right and, and freedom uh, uh, of movement. Uh, if you say that uh, maybe we cannot open. Um, uh, borders right now for global justice reasons, but we can work towards freedom of movement in the long run. And finally, uh, you could also combine freedom and, uh, uh, of movement and, and, and democracy by saying, and this is maybe the most surprising combination, and I will pursue that argument, by saying that uh, we can promote freedom of movement if we can link it to citizenship. Remember that Joe Karen suggested that citizenship is an exclusion mechanism. And I want to argue that it can also be used as, an argue, as, a, as a mechanism for enhancing the space of freedom of movement globally. And, uh, and we'll come to that. Uh, and if that is possible, then you could say we have a goal of freedom of movement that can be combined with democracy if we can pursue freedom, uh, if we can have an, if you find an argument that Democracy is not just about self-determination over, uh, over immigration, but democracy has its own reasons for promoting freedom of movement and for the admission of certain categories of immigrants. That doesn't mean that global justice is irrelevant, but it means it has to be pursued separately through a different set of uh, policies, uh, which may include, for example, you know, uh, not just development aid, but also immigration policies uh, that help, uh, that actually conducive to development. So um, this is. Uh, let, let me make, try to make uh, now the argument for 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 the democratic perspective a little bit more plastic and uh, and easier to grasp by using uh, a parable, a Kafkaesque parable that I came up with uh, some time ago uh, when I was living in Italy. I just found on the internet this. Uh, ground floor plan of a Baroque uh, palazzo. Huh? Uh, and uh, the, uh, the characteristics of these uh, palazzi is that they have multiple rooms. You know, and, uh, if nearly every room has adjacent rooms on each side. So imagine that uh, you, you know, this is, this is like, um, this is, no, well, I don't use the pointer because otherwise I might switch it off. But uh, that, uh, this little human figure here, imagine this is you. You are uh, in one of these rooms. And the question is, under which conditions uh, could you uh, have a claim to enter one of the other rooms? And uh, I have three scenarios. Let's start with the most outlandish scenario, but that is a little, it's most closely like the international state system. Imagine that each of these rooms represents a country. Right? So in this case, the rooms are kind of governed separately and independently from each other. And let's imagine they are democracies. So in this case, uh, each room has a government. And let's just call the guard uh, uh, is the government, right? So, and the guard, like in Kafka's stories, has one single role to open or close the doors. Huh? Uh, since the room uh, in which you live is a democracy, you have been involved in electing the guard. And the guard is actually under your instructions because you are a citizen, right? And it's obvious that if you, you would elect a guard that has a duty to open the doors if you want to leave, that's your right of exit, right? The question is, and this is why I call it the palace with the double doors, what happens then? You know, there are palaces have you know, inside doors and outside doors between rooms. So the guard opens the door and you stand in front of another door that is closed, that leads to the room you want to get in. And that room is not governed by you. You, are not, you have not voted for that guard. You have not been part of the, uh, of, of the electorate there. So you have to knock on the door and ask to be let in. And the question is now, what could you say to that guard that would convince him or her? So, you say, let, let me in, I want to move into your room. And the guard says, well, why would you choose my room rather than any of the other three? What, what answer could you give? One possible answer is uh, to say, listen, I'm really, you know, this is an emergency case. 
uh, the guard whom we have elected has turned out to be a crazy psychopath and he has a knife and he has threatened to kill me. Open this door or otherwise I will be dead. Right? So that's a very, very strong reason for the guard on the other side to let you in. You know, you can't say, well, cross the room and move to the other side right? because you will be dead. So this is the case of refugees. Right? They have a very, very strong claim to be admitted uh, if their life is in danger, if they are persecuted or um, the, uh, You might uh, have another reason. You could, for example, say, uh, listen, I want to move into your room because last year you already admitted my spouse and she is now living in your room. So I want to be united with my spouse. And, uh, uh, Again, it's a pretty strong reason. Maybe not just as strong because the guard would also say, well, I sent back your spouse. But if the spouse has already been living there for a long time, she has a right to stay. So that makes it plausible that you want to join her more than she being sent back. Um, you could also say that uh, I've heard you have fantastic paintings in your room and uh, you know, in mine there's nothing uh, and I really want to see these paintings. Uh, to which the guard would plausibly respond something like, okay, I'll let you in uh, for a fee. You pay for a ticket, right? You can see the paintings, but then you go back. You will be a visitor rather than an immigrant. Right? And that's, that's a good response in general uh, for that kind of reason. And finally, uh, you could say something like, uh, you know, I've seen on the internet pictures of your room and it looks really shabby. I'm an interior decorator uh, and I've redone my room and it's look, look how, how nice it looks, right? Uh, if you let me in, you know, I'll decorate your room. Uh, this is what you get for, for letting me uh, immigrate. And uh, to this, the guard might say, well, you know, if it's, this is in my interest, it's in your interest, uh, I don't uh, do any harm to anybody, so maybe I should let you in. But it's not like you have a right to immigrate in this case. Huh? Uh, so that would be the case of economic vibration in, in general. So this is what I'm, what I'm getting at. In the situation of independent states or countries that are represented by these rooms, immigrants in general need uh, positive reasons uh, why another country should admit them. And all of the reasons I've mentioned are reasons for admission, but they're unequally strong. Yeah? And, uh, and that's something that is very often missing in the philosophical debate that just asks, can it ever be legitimate to control immigration? If states control immigration, they still may have positive reasons to admit certain types of immigrants because of uh, their situation, because of, of their human rights, because of what they can contribute, etc., etc. So that's the positive case, democratic case uh, for immigration, if you want. Now, we still haven't got to a right to free movement in that scenario. But now, imagine two other scenarios. One is that the rooms are not governed independently. But uh, there is a joint government of the palace. There is a, a management of the palace, right? And uh, you are, have been involved in voting for the palace management. So in this case, you would certainly have uh, voted for local governments in the rooms that have a strong obligation to keep the rooms, the double doors open between the rooms so that you could move freely between them. It's quite natural to assume if there is a joint government, huh, then that government would be responsible for instructing the sub-level, sub-state governments to keep the doors open just as the doors between provinces and federal states are open. Or, uh, you know, Warsaw City no longer has city gates uh, and, and, and walls. So uh, you can move in and out of Warsaw as a Polish citizen without any problem. That's freedom of movement. Now, that's uh, a dream of some people who want to have a world state, or a world federal state, in which freedom of movement would be a quite natural thing to establish, but there are many reasons why a world state is maybe neither achievable nor desirable. And we won't go into this, uh, but uh, I would side with the people who, with Immanuel Kant, so this may be also a nightmare. Yeah? No other state outside <laughs> the world state you can go to, and if that uh, turns into a despotry or the anarchy, it's very hard to repair. So plurality of states may be actually a good thing to have. Now, 
Thank you, Tom, for too long, as I suspected. <laughs> so quickly, the third scenario, which is in between the other two, is how can you still have freedom of movement in a world where states are governed independently? Well, very easy. Uh, neighboring rooms need to agree. They need to have an agreement uh, that the doors will be open so that the citizens of each room can move into the other room based on reciprocity. That enhances uh, the freedom of the citizen of each room. So from a democratic perspective, it's good for them. Uh, and if the disparity between the rooms is not huge, then there is also no obstacle uh, that, uh, against such uh, arrangements. And you could say the EU is somehow between the second and the third scenario, but it's a way how you can bring it about freedom of movement, not arguing from global justice and abstract reasons, but saying it's in the mutual interest of citizens of states to establish freedom of movement where it's possible to do so. Not globally, but maybe on a regional scale. So, uh, this is basically what I've argued. Um, and uh, since I'm already at 30 minutes, I will keep this very short now. Uh, freedom, of, freedom of movement is expanding the liberties and opportunities of citizens through reciprocal agreements. Uh, and it can be achieved in various ways through uh, regional unions, free movement agreements between states, or through multiple citizenship. If you tolerate multiple citizenship, it means people have the right to move between two states. So at the individual level, that's a big booster for freedom of movement that you can get in the real world. Uh, asylum uh, is a, a duty to admit uh, people because they lack, they have been deprived of the protection of their citizenship of origin. So here again, there's not just the human right involved, but there's citizenship involved, very strongly. States have a duty to protect the fundamental rights of their own citizens. And if one state fails, that casts a shadow on the state system as a whole, because the whole justification for having separate states is that each of them protects uh, their citizens. Uh, so uh, in order to repair that uh, legitimacy uh, deficit, uh, that comes from states failing to protect their citizens. Uh, asylum is a duty that states have towards the citizens of failed states uh, that do not live up to this expectation. Family reunion, I've already explained, is something that uh, links membership claims of immigrants uh, that are already in uh, with uh, those of outsiders who have a strong uh, private uh, relation to them. And economic migration, and I will talk about this tomorrow in case you also come into that talk, uh, could be justified under a rationale of a triple benefit for the immigration country, for the same country, and for the migrants themselves. Uh, and again, there is a democratic uh, justification there, not just a uh, universal human rights justification, because if it's beneficial for the citizens of uh, each country involved in such an agreement, it can be uh, seen as in the interest of the common good. And this is what democracy uh, defends uh, in the end. So um, let me come very quickly to the final uh, part, which is now slightly more skeptical. So uh, you have uh, in the EU and, and generally in Western democracies uh, a situation where uh, liberal norms are <coughs> embedded in institutions such as in the independent judiciary, uh, I want to say this in this country too, uh, and uh, division of powers in general, and uh, um, where ideally these rooms are to a certain extent shielded from the democratic process. But in addition to those liberal norms that are defended by institutions, even against majorities of citizens, in order for the reasons uh, for immigration that I have uh, spelled out to be uh, effective, you also need democratic support. You need uh, majorities of citizens that are willing to accept the argument that uh, letting in immigrants on these grounds is actually beneficial. You know, not just the moral duty, but also something that democracies ought to value. Now, uh, the problem is that uh, this latter part is really difficult to achieve in the current context where you have a deep division in society between those who see immigration and the diversity that it generates as something that is beneficial, that is improving their societies, 
and others that see it as deeply disturbing because it's forcing a, trans a transformational society that they don't want. Um, the question is, does so it's no longer a right, a, a question of the people having a right of self-determination over immigration, but it's an antagonism within the people between those who see that immigration is beneficial and those who see it as, uh, uh, as a problem. Now, uh, that means there are these two conflicting conceptions and visions of democracy that you could call short and open democracy and closed democracy. Uh, in an open democracy, national self-determination uh, over immigration is constrained through liberal democratic norms. And the loss of national control over immigration is outweighed by the potential gains through mobility opportunities for their own citizens and contributions to global justice that you can make through keeping immigration uh, fairly and reasonably open. And there are sometimes majorities that support this in some way or the other. But they tend to be unstable and you cannot take them for granted. And closed democracy uh, is the opposite image where people say this is part of, uh, you know, we want to defend who we are, our traditional way of life, our culture, uh, and uh, we, uh, therefore, we need to step up immigration control and uh, constrain freedom of movement. And uh, certainly, we, we cannot be obliged to let in any people on humanitarian grounds. So the question I want to raise is, can we imagine that uh, European democracies remain stable if they close their borders? And you can do a thought experiment, you know, going back in history. Have there been democracies that have widely opened their doors over a certain time, become countries of immigration, and then closed them and still remained democratic? And the answer is yes, uh, take the case of the US, you know wide open door immigration policy until World War I, and then in uh, the 1920s, a heavy closure of immigration uh, on racial grounds and ethnic quota. It was really nasty, but in that period of the interwar period, you see at the end, at least, uh, still progressive policies like the uh, Roosevelt's New Deal, and uh, that lasted until the 1950s and uh, 60s, the Hard Sell Act finally reopened the, the U.S. as an immigration country. So democracy survived. You know, it was quite, uh, it was not clear. Uh, there, are, there is a nice novel by Joseph Roth, you know, about uh, uh, the conspiracy against America. What if Lind Charles Lindbergh had become president? Could fascism also have happened in, in the U.S.? And the answer is yes, it could have happened, but it didn't. Now the question is, can we, be, can we trust that in Europe, if populist governments uh, grasp power and stay in power and cut back on immigration and realize the closed vision of democracy, that democracy could still survive may, or a whole generation like it did in the US. And my answer to this is probably not. Because what has changed since then is that societies themselves are divided over this issue. It's not like you can close the border and then there is an American people or a Polish people or an Austrian people that will just uh, you know, uh, happily assimilate the immigrants that are there and uh, uh, under the condition that no one else comes and joins them. You will have nearly 50% of those societies who think this is deeply disrespecting their own identities of migrant background, uh, pro-diversity, uh, mobile populations. And they will see that their own opportunities as citizens are cut down by governments that cut down on freedom of movement. You know, their, their space of opportunity shrinks if countries opt out of the EU, for example, in a huge way, as we have seen in Brexit. So you will have uh, a fight that is a fight about which vision of democracy prevails. And if the closed vision prevails, then my guess is that may uh, also lead to the backsliding of democracy itself. And the correlation that we see between anti-immigrant policies and policies against the rule of law is not coincidental. It just shows that today at least uh, the attitude for closed borders is also linked to an attitude that is dangerous for democracy itself that uh, tends to undermine its uh, rule of law and, and, and liberal foundations. So in the end I think the paradox is almost like the famous one that democracies could democratically elect an autocratic government abolishing democracy. And that is my final reason why I think self-determination is the wrong idea here. 
if this is what self-determination is about, then uh, you know it shouldn't be po <laughs> uh, possible that democracy is self-determined to abolish democracy. That's a limit for democracy itself. But uh, that limit cannot be fully constitutionally guaranteed. It needs to be fought over in political battles over which version of democracy prevails. And I think I'll leave it with that. And, um, uh, I'm looking forward to your questions. Thank you very much. <laughs>